CCL 15. Good to see some familiar faces out there. My name is Melinda Heine, and my presentation over the next three days is going to be called The Challenge of Progressive Education. The uh, theme of our conference is beauty, and I'm getting the flip side of that. I hope it's not too depressing because it's mostly about the ugliness of progressive education. Is it, can you hear me in the back? Okay, is it too loud? Or? Sounds good. Okay. Just a little bit of an um, overview of what I'm going to cover uh, today. The topic is going to be the roots of progressive education, and I've picked four individuals that I believe are representative of their specific centuries and in um, prom promoting ideas that we would call progressive, uh, and they have impacted not only public education, but Lutheran education. Um, what I hope that you will see it by the end of all of this is there is a direct link from these progressive people of the past uh, to our Lutheran schools today and the challenges, what are we going to do about it? Uh, after we, we'll go as far as we can on that today and tomorrow, um, finish that up and maybe get into the second part, philosophy and methods of progressive education. Um, my goal in that is so that you can kind of put a microscope on yourself. Um, Progressive education and classical education are two diametrically opposed systems of education and methodology of teaching. But we are all infected with it, and um, I'm going to use my husband as an example. I've said this every time I've spoken on this topic, and he said it as a graduate of Seward, it took him 15 years to unlearn the things he learned there about teaching, and he's still trying to uh, get rid of it. And I think we're all that way. <laughs> Last, uh, the third section will be on impediments to classical Lutheran education, and that will be challenges that we have as classical educators to try and become more classical and um, get rid of some of these things that we have adopted. So, to get started on that, progressive education, what exactly is it? I guess in the narrow sense, we would say progressive education is defined as the educational movement that came out of the progressive era on the heels of the Industrial Revolution. So you think of Theodore Roosevelt, the Bull Moose Party, as a progressive political party. They wanted to use the big stick of the government to do good. And this is what Horace Mann wanted to do with education, in the same way, progressive education. Um, but for these purposes, um, over the next few days, I'm going to speak of progressive education in a very broad sense not just the narrow industrial era of the Progressive Party, but ideas that are reflected in the whole progressive movement of education. So um, for some of you purists, just keep that in mind. I'm, I'm being very broad in, in that. And I'm also including in that some of the postmodern trends that we have today. I guess you, would, you, you might even consider education today not so much progressive as much, but almost postmodern. But I'm going to include that, and I'll call it all progressivism, just so you understand. Other people might just sum up progressive education as just the educational arm of the progressive political movement, or maybe romanticism applied to education. Um, in a nutshell, this is how they describe themselves. Their, their goal is to produce students with higher order thinking skills, able to function in the electronic age, we become problem solvers, creative thinkers, and lifelong learners. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Because it's very similar to a lot of the mission statements that you, you hear in Lutheran schools. Okay? It's very progressive. Uh, the way you accomplish this, according to a progressive educator, is through hands-on projects, um, collaborative learning. Students start to construct knowledge rather than learn it. They construct it through discovery. And it is built on the philosophical foundation of atheism, evolution, and materialism. Anti-tradition, anti-authority, it emphasizes skills and strategies over content learned, and it is truly a 180 degree shift from the old education that we consider classical or Lutheran. Results have been terrible. They have been terrible. Um, in just Lutheran schools alone, I don't need to just speak to public schools, or education in America overall, we've seen a decline in academics, We've seen a decline in theological understanding. We have a dumbing down of our pastors because we no longer have a prep school system and they don't have the languages that they used to have. Uh, we see our colleges and our universities and our 
elementary schools being alienated from the congregations, and we see a syncretism or a um, grouping with entities that we really share no common goals with at all. But we want to join with them because we want their approval and accreditation and such. Progressive education is most detrimental, I think, to disadvantaged students more than the average student or the good student. Sometimes they can survive it and do quite well, you know, in college or university beyond that, but it's very detrimental to uh, students with special needs or disadvantaged students. So, how did we get here to, in this terrible situation? We can say that it, you know, some of these ideas go all the way back to Plato. Um, we can also take some of it back to the Garden of Eden where Satan said, we shall be as gods, or half God said. Um, just keep this in mind that this is not a neutral uh, philosophy. It is diametrically opposed to classical Lutheran education, and we need to wake up to it and realize we are in the battle. So, uh, with that very positive <laughs> introduction, <laughs> let's go on to the first man. I picked four people um, out as representative, as I said, of these, of these centuries. Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 1700s, Horace Mann in the early 1800s, John Dewey in the late um, 1800s, early 1900s, and Bill William Ayers uh, for the 21st century. And, I'm, and I've just been using these as examples of, of promoters of progressive ideas. They all have a number of threads in common, and I think they're very interesting. Um, one point I want to make, and I hope I make this repeatedly through the next three days, is that we cannot understand education apart from the philosophical and the theological foundation from which it springs. You can't just take a method and say, this is fun, let's do this, and not really see why it was instituted, you know, what are the reasons for doing this, and what are the goals and results going to be. So um, I'm going to focus on uh, these men now in their, in their spiritual lives so we can get a little idea of really who we are that we're drawing from. Okay? All of them had a Calvinist background. Um, all of them rejected what went on in their lives at one time or another original sin and human depravity. And they all apostatized from Orthodox Christianity that they had been taught in their youth. Um, Rousseau, he rejected Calvinism for Catholicism and then he returned back to the Calvinist faith for political reasons. But he eventually rejected the Christian faith altogether and became kind of a deist. But he's known for his snide remarks against the clergy. Horace Mann uh, rejected his strict Calvinist upbringing and adopted Unitarian Utopianism. And John Dewey likewise made a conscious and deliberate rejection of Christianity. He grew up in the Congregational Church, was very active in it under his parents, and he devolved into kind of a social gospelism and then outright atheism, secular humanism. As far as Bill Ayers is concerned, I didn't find a whole lot about his own personal spiritual story but uh, we do know that he became an ardent, violent communist, and his parents were members of a congregational church, so we are assuming that he had some Christian, um, you know, some Christian exposure as a, as a child. It wasn't that he had no knowledge of it. All of these men, all of them, none of them were lower life. They all hobnobbed with the intellectual, the social, and the political elite of their time, and these people help them, pull strings to get them jobs, and so forth. There is a marked difference between a couple of them. Um, Ayers and Rousseau were not classically trained. Mann and Dewey were. And if, if I would give you a paragraph that each of these men had written, you could tell just from reading it which ones had the classical education and which ones did not. Um, Rousseau was kind of self-educated. Uh, his dad taught him to read, I think, and he got a little bit of tutoring over the years from different priests, but mostly self-educated by reading himself. Ayers' education was primarily public school and education degrees, whereas Mann and Dewey both had a very rigorous classical education in high school and college um, level. One of the things that, that I was find is very interesting about these guys, especially Dewey, you know, you think, how, if he had not had the classical education and the classical training he did, there is no way he would have gotten to the levels he did in academia, just impossible. Um, even so, um, you know, he rejected his Christianity. All right, now what I'd like you to do now is take out your, uh, your outline, follow along with that, um, 
as I speak. And um, at the end of it, if there's something that I don't touch on, I may skip over some of them. Um, just let me know, and I'll, I'll go back and elaborate a little further. We'll start out with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, someone that we know as an Enlightenment philosopher. Uh, it's a name most of us are familiar with, but as I said before, most of us have not read anything that he wrote. Um, he was born on June 28, 1712, to French, French Huguenot parents in Geneva, Switzerland. His mother died immediately after death, just like within a couple of weeks, and he and his brother were raised in the first 10 years of their life by their father, who was just trying to take care of them. Uh, his father did teach him to read, and as a young boy, he says that he and his dad read books. So if you're talking about a 10-year-old and younger, and they're reading classical literature, that tells you something right there. You know, that a child that age is reading you know, pretty heavy material, and that's something that was pretty much expected in that era, and, and it's not today. Anyway, at age 10, his father totally abandoned the family, and Rousseau and his cousin were sent to board with a, a Calvinist minister in nearby Bossy, Switzerland. Um, Rousseau and his memoirs indicate that this guy was a positive influence on him. His name was Reverend Lambertier. He taught him Latin, some little catechesis, and he said the house was one of piety, strict Christian piety. At one time, Rousseau actually aspired to be a Protestant minister. He was interested in philosophy and things like that. So he wanted to do that as a child, but there were no funds available to go to the university. So he was apprenticed at first to a city notary and later an engraver, and these were not good vocations for him. He was not good at them. His life from that point on, he ran away from his uh, the engraver apprenticeship. And he just kind of became a vagabond and a, and a teenage idler. Uh, engaged in petty thievery, started chronic lying, which became something he did all his life. Um, when he was on this vagabond, running around with you know boys and such, um, he met up with a woman named Louise. It's probably pronounced De Barren, it's, it's a French word, but I'll just anglicize it and say it's Louise de Warren. She was an agent for the Counter Reformation and somewhat of a sh shadowy figure. Um, some biographers say that she actually worked for the French government, but what was going on in France at that time with the Catholic Church was, was making organized efforts to win people back, particularly near the Swiss border, you know, where you have Calvin, the, the legacy of Calvin. So they, they've got these people that are trying to win people back into the Roman Church. And this was going on for you know, 100 years post-Trent. Anyway, uh, I guess I would consider this woman kind of a, you know, the bait, you know, kind of. She was a good-looking lady, and she flirted with him, and she found him, you know, wandering around the streets, and took him under her wing. And she sent him to a place called the Hospice of the Catechumens, was a place where we go through um, adult instruction, we call them an adult membership class, to get back into the Catholic Church. It was kind of a monastery for converts. Um, interesting little side on that. Um, at that time, France had its own version of homeless bums, and they called them professional converts. And so these guys would wander around and they would show up at the monastery or the church or wherever these classes were taking place. They'd stay there for a while, get free room and board for a couple weeks, as long as they wanted to, take the classes, become converted, baptized, and then when they wanted to, they'd move on down the road to the next place to did it. So um, Rousseau says that there were several of those people at, in his class, or there's other young women, but they were mostly all teenagers and young adults that were in this, this instruction class. So while he's at the monastery, um, he evidently was the victim of a, a homosexual assault. Um, you kind of feel sorry for him. It's, it's hard to feel sorry for Rousseau when you read his writings all, but this is one thing that I do have some feelings for the guy about. So he didn't really know what was going on, he was young and innocent and such. So he went and reported it to the mother superior, and her response to him was to be quiet and not say anything, don't tell anybody. And to his credit, he did not do that. He went and tried to find a man that was in the institution and, and you know, tell him the story. And, and he got a worse response from that guy, who just basically kind of said, uh, smirked at him and said, you're making a big deal out of nothing. Um, maybe you even liked it. So he had to go back to the dorm and with these um, so-called professional converts. And I, I think probably in, in respect to his living conditions, he re re um, resorted to the converted and went back to the Catholic Church in, in record time. So he was baptized on April 23rd, 1728, and then he went back to Louise. She became kind of a, a mother, sister, lover, you know, all in one to him for 10 years. He finally um, 
broke, broke it off with her because she wanted to live with him and another man in a kind of a French threesome. He said no to his credit, so he went on. Um, she supported him as, a, as a, his patroness, and she was the first of many women who did support Rousseau through his life. He was not someone who was good at getting a job and sticking with it. He was looking for patrons and people to support him. And Louise uh, introduced him to a lot of the big names in the French um, you know, salons and such. And that's where he had his connections with some of these people because he, you know, he came from a middle class, lower class family. So after he broke up with Louise, um, he connected with a laundress named Teresa Levasseur, and they remained partners for the rest of their lives, never married. Um, his relationship with her was not welcomed by his prominent friends. They kept telling him, you know, get rid of this trailer trash woman, you know, you can do better. Um, you know, you're hobnobbing with the highest society. Uh, she had five children by him, and every one of them Rousseau took to the orphanage when it was born. Um, against her wishes, too. Um, and he kept this a secret for years. He was finally exposed by Voltaire, you know, who was trying to bring him down. Um, Rousseau's reasoning on that was that since the children had been formally deposited at an orphanage, they were not being abandoned. And his hopes of doing important work in philosophy certainly could not be um, ruined um, by the time it would take to raise a family and the unjust laws of marriage were going to con uh, condemn him to a life of lifelong commitment with a, an unsuitable woman. So those were his reasons for having nothing more to do with her. Um, these acts, you know, his, his reputation as such, and his audacity of presenting a book on childbearing, this book is called The Meal, um, brought him great criticism during his life. Um, he carried the guilt with him all his life, by the way. He's quoted as saying, anyone who fails up to bring his own children a week long and bitterly for his error and will never be consoled. His fame grew along with the criticism, though, and he continued to drift further and further away from the Calvinist Cal Cal faith that he learned in his youth. And it should be noted that frequently he says that he, in, in his writings that he was not interested in theology or doctrine. Um, one of the instances of his life, he says he's walking along a trail and he gets a revelation from God that man is innately good. You know, the, this whole doctrine of depravity that he had learned in his Calvinist upbringing was bearing on him too much, but he received a revelation man is innately good, the dogma of the original sin is wrong, and supposedly after that he never doubted anything, even though rejecting God's word uh, for the rest of his life. His, his, um, Educational theories are based on that, that the child is good. So keep that in mind when we um, look at some of the things that Rousseau advocated for the classroom, and they're based on the idea that the child is naturally good. You know, why are we accepting them? That's the question. Okay, that's Rousseau. Put aside the educational ideas advocated by Rousseau. I think we'll do those all at the end, or pick those up tomorrow, and we'll move on next to Horace Mina. Uh, maybe one thing you could do tonight um, when you go over that page, educational ideas advocated by each of these people, kind of make a check by the ones that you think you see in your school or in yourself or something, you know, just as a, a kind of a mirror on yourself. Okay, next guy is Horace Mann. I'll, I'll have him as representative of the earliest, early 19th century in the United States. Horace Mann is the one of the four that we rarely hear any criticism of, even among Lutherans. You know, he's praised as being, you know, father of schools, promoter of education, so on and so forth. Um, not as admirable as we have been told. Horace Mann was born on the 4th of May, 1796, in on a family farm in Franklin, Massachusetts. The family were they were was a hard scrabble, poor, um, strict Calvinist family. Um, he worked very hard on the farm and he only had a little bit of schooling before the time he went to university. Um, but he was very bookish and he was very driven to succeed and he was very driven to learn. His memoirs indicate that he also had a legalistic spiritual background and he, like so, struggled with the idea of the depravity of man and that was hard for him to accept. Um, he also, you know, the limited atonement and election all tied into that. He didn't like those. Uh, one incident that later impacted his conversion to Unitarianism later in his life was when his brother drowned and the preacher at the funeral suggested that his brother was in hell for swimming on the Sabbath. 
and that bothered him. You know, he was very stressed about that. But he was a very intellectually minded person, and he read and studied on his own until he was able to gain admittance to Brown University. Back in those days, 1816, if you wanted to go to university, colonial universities, you had to pass an entrance exam, which was basically um, hardcore translation of the biblical and the theological and the classical languages. Um, the idea that a high school diploma would qualify you for college didn't come along for another 30 or 40 years in the United States. So at that point, you know, entrance exam. Uh, like I said, he was a driven student. He graduated in three years of valedictorian Brown, and the title of his valedictory address was The Progressive Character of Human Race. And that gives a little hint of the worldview that he was already establishing. He married Charlotte, who was the daughter of the president of Brown, and that opened him up to all sorts of opportunities because of political connections. Um, however, she died when she was only 20, and that was another thing that very, very seriously bothered him. He, he, how could a benevolent God take away his dear Charlotte? He could understand the brother. Maybe the brother did something wrong by swimming on the Sabbath, but dear, perfect Charlotte, you know, why did God take her? And, and he struggled with that became friends with the Peabody sisters, which uh, they had Unitarian connections, and they introduced him to uh, William Ellery Channing, who was one of the leading Unitarians at the time in the United States, who counseled him um, on his problems in that respect. So he's drifting into this Unitarianism, rejecting the Calvinism and the depravity of man. He wrote in his memoirs, I remember the day, the hour, the place, and the circumstance when in the agony of despair I broke the spell, the spell of Calvinism, that bound me. So he ended up absorbing the new Unitarian theology and new values, and he started associating with like-minded liberals. He graduated and, and read law and became a legislator, and he was a tireless worker for his clients. He was known for his great ability to argue both sides of an argument either way. Uh, his interests were very much human, humanitarian and liberal. He was an advocate of the temperance movement, although he did reject Christian groups as being part of the, the coalition. He was interested in the humane treatment of the insane. He, one of the things he argued was that the insane are by default um, wards of the state because the parents aren't doing their job in caring for these people. Against the lotteries, in favor of strict Sabbath laws, and so forth. He was a zealous, zealous workaholic, very articulate. During this time as a lawyer, uh, he developed friendships with other leading Unitarian politicians, socialists, intellectuals. And despite his limited, limited educational experience, he was chosen over better, better qualified candidates to be the first chairman of the newly created Massachusetts Board of Education. Now, a little bit on that. Um, intellectuals in the United States, um, in the universities have been going over to Germany, particularly from Prussia, becoming very enamored with what they were doing educationally over there in their universities, wanting to bring it back here. The problem was in the United States, particularly in Massachusetts, everybody had their own little school system and it wasn't ruled by the state at all. So they convinced the state legislature to create what they call the Board of Education. So these schools are already in existence. They're run and funded by local entities. But the legislature says, okay, we're creating this board and now you are all under them and under their authority. That's how, you know, the bureaucracy came later. So Mann was set up to be the head of this and kind of the workhorse of this group. One of the things that was, I, I want to bring up about that is, at that time, that he really had to his work cut out for him because at that time, colonial, or colonial, post-colonial New England, post-revolutionary New England was one of the most literate places on earth where most of the people could read. Uh, it was, some have said that 96% of the people were fully literate, and when you say literate then, they could read the hard documents of the, you know, of, of the founding fathers and stuff, unlike people today. And uh, so, so he's trying to sell the people on the need for public schools, okay? They didn't really need them. They already had the, the problem covered. But he had to sell them on it. So he was very, very good at what you call advertising and able to demonize people. So he made it out to be that if you were against public education, you were against an educated public. And people fell like dominoes for that. You know, oh, no, I'm not against education, so therefore you better support me. Um, that was his tack. He was very, very zealous in that. Um, he called it a crusade against ignorance, 
and he browbeat people into supporting him. During the years uh, when he served as the Secretary of Education for Massachusetts, one of the things he was supposed to do was go around all of, all the schools and the little cities and out in hinterlands and visit them, and then come back and make a report to the state legislature on what what can we do, you know, to make this better. So in 1838, first report, he addressed the deplorable state of public school buildings. He wanted to call schools uh, temples of learning. And from that, we get what we have today. You know, the best building in town is public school and the small school or small town. You know, the biggest building in town is public school. Um, we get that from Horace Mann. He excoriated the failure of local school boards to compel attendance. Even though there were no mandatory school laws, he took them to task for not enforcing that. Um, he excoriated the public um, apathy toward funding, and he addressed the issue of whole pay. Next year, he went around again. He advocated that teachers be trained in Thomas Gallaudet's whole word reading method for the deaf. Um, most of you who are teachers probably know that this sight reading and the, the whole word reading came from this method of teaching deaf children because they couldn't hear, so they would memorize the whole word. Well, man thought, you know what, that's the way we need to teach reading. Why do we waste our time teaching the alphabet and all these lower level skills when they can just memorize the word, you know? And I'm quoting him when I say, he says, I am convinced that our greatest error in teaching children read life is beginning with the alphabet. So this, this, this whole, whole language reading thing is very, very old. It is a very old argument. And they have been trying to voice that on schools ever since the 1830s, okay? Well, that was the point of his second report. Third report, he addressed the issues of libraries and reading materials in the, the publicly funded schools and wanted all books banned that had dogma or doctrine, Christian orthodoxy. He allowed for the Bible. You can have the Bible as a moral guide, but that was it. We cannot have specific doctrine in our public schools. 1841, the next report, he recommends the school consolidation to eliminate all diversity of schools. That was one of his big bugaboos. He said, we've got too many schools. And they're all different. And that's not good. What we want is one giant school where everybody can come and then we can control what they learn. And they're all going to come out as good citizens of the United States. So the school consolidation, again, that's 150 years old and we have that today. He wanted to diminish all competition uh, also within the public system by making things all the same. Uh, next year, 1842, another brilliant uh, move he turned the shakers into, you know, made that an example of them. They were kind of a, an unpopular cult at that time in the United States. But he's going around making his yearly visits and he wanted to go inspect their schools and they said, sorry, you don't have any authority over us. Um, and he just drove them, made them dirt in the mind of the public because they refused, you know, they were um, ignorant. They wanted ignorance. Next thing he did too was he started attacking the middle class because they opposed taxation for school purposes and they were supporting the private academies. You're taking money away from the community by supporting these private academies. Your money should be going to the public system. You know, for the common good of the nation. You're not patriotic. So he went against them that. He also uh, really, really came down hard on the rich people that, you know, it is your responsibility to provide education for other people's children. Do your funding. You do it. They can't, they can't afford it, and we do it. 1843, another radical thing, he started uh, the promotion of phrenology. Uh, phrenology, most of you may remember that, it's the quack science that a person, the bumps on your head or the shape of your head, um, you can tell somebody's character traits by these things. And so, for example, a violent person would, would have less, uh, a less, we call it less, less space in his brain for benevolence and kindness. You know, it's total quackery, but um, many people aren't aware that this is the father of, of, you know, the foundation of psychology and psychiatry in the United States. Anyway, um, man wanted that as a mandatory course in the public normal schools, and it was for a while. It was. Um, next thing he wanted was he wanted theology replaced. Um, with, with psychology, that's what would come out, would, would be theology. And also he wanted the curriculum to include more than just academic subjects, we need to start teaching health. 
Okay, we've got that today too. It tells us now something has to be taught. Last uh, report, 1844, was his advocacy of central control of all Massachusetts schools in a vehement attack on the Latin masters of Boston. And finally, the Latin masters are starting to fight back. And they argued against many of, of uh, man's things that he was, he was arguing for. For example, they argued against his uh, advocacy of infant schools. They called them infant schools. We call them preschools. Um, Man and the socialists and the radicals, they wanted kids out of the hands of parents under the, the rule of the state. So they're going to have these infant schools so we can get these kids out of the dysfunctional families and we can, we can teach them ourselves. And the Boston masters fought back against that. They fought back against the whole word instruction. They fought back against phrenology. They fought back against the state normal schools. Prior to that, people wanted to be a teacher. You would be going to Harvard or Yale or whatever university. Brown University in your area. Now, a man wants state normal schools for teachers only, and we're going to have a special curriculum, which is not going to be classical. He had uh, very heterodox notions of sin, and, and this gets back to the psychology thing. Okay, so why did he want psychology, this old psychology? Man? Well, psychology meaning what? The study of the psyche or the study of the soul? Okay. The two answers to that are, are you know, we, we want to explain human behavior by two things. It's either biological, you're born with it, okay, we've got that coming around today, two people saying there's a gay gene, I can't help it, I'm born homosexual, okay, that's the biological one. Or it's the environmental one. It's not your fault, you know, you grew up in poverty or whatever the excuse is, your parents were abusive. Whatever it is, that's an explanation for your behavior, but it's not original sin, okay? Well, that's what psychology does. It's got you know dozens and dozens of different fields of study, and they all are going back to one of those two things. Let's explain human behavior somehow without taking into account original sin. And and this is what man wanted as part of the curriculum. And what do you see today in Concordia? Is how many classes of psychology do you have to take uh, compared to how many classes of theology? I think it's more now. I think it's more. All right, so. Uh, Backtrack a year, man married a woman named Mary Peabody. She was a liberal woman with influential Unitarian connections, and they were good friends with some of these, you know, high people, such as Julie Ward Howe, the author of Battling with the Republic. They went on their honeymoon together over to Prussia, so they could look at the schools over there and uh, bring this stuff back. Um, man, man was having progress getting other states to adopt the Prussian model. Um, the first state to, to adopt them actually was Michigan, not Massachusetts, 1835. Pennsylvania got it in too. Guess who the biggest opponents were in Pennsylvania? They were the Muhlenberg Lutherans. I know. They were the ones that didn't want it, but they didn't have the cloud to fight, and it went through in Pennsylvania and then Massachusetts, and one by one the states have fallen to progressive education, the Prussian model. Um, man was able to, to get this coalition of people uniting under this. The Unitarians wanted it. For, so we could perfect society. The socialists wanted it so they could control people, political control. The political conservatives actually wanted it too because we're having all this Catholic immigration with the Irish coming in. They're taking over Boston. They're bringing Roman Catholicism back into the United States and that was what we ran away from 200 years ago. So they got the Protest he got the Protestants to go along with them and the teachers wanted it for job prestige and more money and such. Three people didn't want it, or three categories didn't want it. Parents, the classical educators, and the theologically orthodox. Those are the ones that didn't want it, but they didn't have the clout. Anyway, Horace Mann went on to become a professor of college in Yellow Springs, Ohio, um, and he has been very successful in transforming American schools 180 degrees from a free market libertarian model to a state system government controlled model of education. Um, this garners him the title Father of the Common Schools, or we sometimes call him Father of the Public Schools, and he was elected posthumously to New York University's Hall of Fame in 1900. So that's Horace Mann. Interestingly, when I was doing some reading in the Lutheran Education Journal of the past, you find many positive things about Horace Mann and all the great things he's doing to fight ignorance. They didn't look very deep, I don't think. Okay. Stick aside the educational ideas advocated by man. Look over those tonight if you would. And see how many of those we still are playing with. Next guy is John Duick. Let's see if I can get him done in just 10 minutes. 
He's the worst one sometimes. <laughs> John Dewey, I believe he was born the same year that Horace Mann died. Uh, 1859, Burlington, Vermont. Um, like Rousseau, like Mann, he came from Calvinist background. His father is a Union War veteran, very prosperous businessman. Uh, his father was not the spiritual head of the family. His father was a businessman. His involvement with the church was mostly like finance committee and trustees and things like that. He was not, not at all with his sons in terms of spiritual training. It was all the mom. She was a very uh, strong-willed, dominant uh, personality. Um, his mom also had political connections and the social connections that helped Dewey um, in his career. She was a tireless worker. I mean, from all indications, she was a believing Christian. Um, but she was very much into social uh, causes, reform movements, um, missionary societies, Bible societies, uh, very, very active in the church. Every church has a woman like that that just does everything. She's a tireless worker, and that was Dewey's mom. She, she tried to encourage her sons in the Christian faith. For example, she required a diary of her sons, a spiritual introspection that she would inspect after they were written. They were forbid, forbidden to play and work on the Sabbath according to these legalistic rules. Um, Dewey writes about how he couldn't play marbles on Sunday and such. Mandatory church attendance, mandatory attendance. Um, in the, the first congregational church of Bur uh, Burlington, of which they were a member when he was 11 years old, under his mom's direction, he applied for admittance to communion, which would kind of be like our confirmation, I guess. So his mother composed his declaration of faith, and then he read it to the elders or whoever they were. And it read like this, I'm quoting, I think I love Christ, and I want to obey him. I thought for some time I should like to unite with this church. Now I want to even more, for it seems a way to confess him, and I should like to remember him at communion, end quote. Okay, two years later, when he was 13, they get a new pastor at this church, and he is a far left-wing liberal uh, theologian whose belief was that men must not be saved, but they must be reconstructed, and society must be reconstructed. Um, and Dewey was very heavily influenced by him as his work in the youth group and such during his teenage years. Um, incidentally about this guy, his name was Lewis, Dr. Louis Brastow, and uh, you pastors might find it interesting reading some of his sermons. You can see he's not orthodox. But um, his appointment to Yale in 1884, um, they signal that as a total downfall of any orthodoxy at Yale University. Anyway, Dewey um, identified with his pastor's separ uh, secular faith, not his mom's. So during high school and college, uh, Dewey was very active in the church, and he was an officer in the youth group and Bible studies and everything. Um, I'm going to skip some of this a little bit. Um, his mom, mom never did give up on her boys. She never gave up on him. She was uh, letters to Dewey that are, that are, you know, in the archives and such have things of her writing to them, things like repeatedly, "Are you all right with Jesus?" Um, in 1883, she wrote to John in, in distress about her, his brother's lack of faith, and she tells him, "You know, I've been reading this book on the atonement, and if David would only read it, I know he would find it convincing." So she's distressed over her son, you know, rejecting his faith basically. Um, Later on in life, when his younger brother is becoming a boozer and flunking out of West Point, the mom writes him again and says, can't you talk to him and convince him to bring him back to Christ? She didn't know that he had already abandoned Christ. He maintained this kind of facade of Christianity for many years, even though long after he had written uh, privately that he no longer believed it. Probably didn't want to buck his mom, you know, didn't want to disappoint her or whatever. All right, so um, what we see about Dewey is very similar to man. Starts out in this strict Calvinist environment, rejects the faith, and then becomes an unbeliever. 1875, Dewey uh, went to the Burlington High School college prep curriculum, and he seemed to despise it, things that he had written later about it. Um, he was a very bookish, very shy young man. He excelled in reading, did poorly in public recitation. He took four years of Latin, Greek, French, grammar, literature, etc. So he had a pretty solid um, liberal arts type education. He continued on his classical education at the University of Vermont. But uh, things about the library books that he checked out, you can see that he's drifting away. He was interested in radical social controversies, evolution, and spe speculative philosophy. Uh, during his senior year, he, he says that he was most influenced by 
authors Herbert Spencer, Thomas Huxley, and August Comte, all infidels. After he graduated, he had no goals in life, didn't know what to do, so he hung around Burlington for a while, and his cousin, Athia Wilson, found him a job teaching in Oil City, Pennsylvania, where he taught Latin algebra and science, and this was a time of loneliness for him. He didn't fit in there very well. Um, he claims in his bio, or autobiography that he struggled over his own personal sin spiritual sincerity, and he says he had a mystical experience there. When he was described, when he was just sitting around in his room and thinking, he said it, it was a blissful feeling that all his worries about personal faith, Christ, and morality were over. And he said, "Quote: I've never had any doubts since then, nor any beliefs." Unquote. So he's getting rid of it. He's getting rid of the Christianity that he learned. He was drawn to the study of philosophy, which was a very bold thing to do at that time, because at that time in American history. Every philosophy professor in the country, according to Dewey's biographer, uh, was, a, was a minister of religion. So for him, as a non-minister, to want to be a philosopher, a philosophy was still kind of tied in with theology then, okay? Um, was very bold for him to want to do that. But he did, and, and that's what he wanted to be, was a philosopher. And he figured he's going to write to these German philosophers who were the Hegelians that lived in in St. Louis and give them an article and if they gave him a positive response he was going to pursue it and if they didn't he wouldn't. Well they did, um, but it took some time. He went on to teach uh, the next year at a, at a private school called Lake City, uh, Vermont and there he was very a very poor teacher there too. Uh, people said that he could not control the boys in his class. He did not have discipline. Um, very incoherent when he talked and you know that was not his calling to be a teacher. It's interesting that the guy that's considered the great father of progressive education is not a good teacher himself. So. Yeah. Anyway, uh, wanting a career in, in, in uh, philosophy required a PhD. He finally got into Johns Hopkins University after three tries. Um, interestingly enough, the reason he got in um, was because his aunt paid, paid the full tuition up front and he said, all right, you need some money. <laughs> Well, let you know. they, they had conflicts um, over his reputation as a lousy teacher. You know, and they wondered if you know, he really should be somebody at the university. Um, but he did get in there and he wanted to go to this university specifically because it was the first university that was deliberately a secular university with no ties at all with Christian theology. And that was the draw for him. It was also you know, very prestigious too. Um, during his time at the university, he became enamored with teachers such as G. Stanley Hall and Wilhelm Wendt, and that's, that's a whole new thing on the psychology and education. But um, he was considered a very gifted original thinker because what he would do is he'd take, take whatever from somebody, whatever he wanted, and then he would add to what he had and move on, and kind of the Hegelian thesis, antithesis thing, and, and, and people thought he was very brilliant because of the way he went about his philosophy that way. It's hard to quote Dewey and say he said this or he said that because he might say something one year and then you can find him in another book saying something totally opposite. So he's very hard to pin down that way, but that was supposed to be the indication of his great great brilliance, I guess. He, the, he went on to the University of Michigan to teach, um, got a position there um, in the philosophy department. He's continuing his, his uh, Christian shell, I, I guess I call it, in Michigan. He organized Bible classes and he was a leader in the Christian uh, Student Christian Association, he lectured on Christian topics and such. But he's living a, a double life because by this time he's saying that he doesn't believe any of this, but he's continuing this, this outward show. And, and that's because it was expected uh, for a university professor to be kind of a Christian gentleman, you know, and have a good moral example in the community and such. So this was something that was expected, and he continued it. 1885, he fell in love with one of the students in his class, Harriet Alice Chipman. Um, she was very serious. Student. She was intellectually minded like him. She was a very strong, domineering personality, just like his mom. But unlike his mom, she was no Christian. She was a free thinking radical. She struggled with depression and underwent psychoanalysis and such. Their daughter um, recalled later in life that the mother was spiritual but not dogmatic, and she never accepted any church dogma. Supposedly, she ridiculed John Dewey for attending prayer meetings in Ann Arbor. She never went with him. Um, under Alice's direction, um, Dewey started writing on feminist themes after they became married, after they were married, 
and uh, followed her lead into the education field. Um, as, a, as a young family, Alice had very unusual child rearing practices. Some weird things. The doctors finally refused to treat the children because they'd never follow up on them, you know, give them the medicine or whatever. If you want kids to be wandering around in the cold outside with no shoes, be and they were stopped by a policeman once on that, and he was promptly told to mind his own business. But the, the idea was that the children should learn by consequences. You know, if their feet freeze, they'll learn. I don't need to tell them. You know, they were very much against this external authority, both Dewey and his wife. Um, the children were notoriously ill-behaved as young children. Um, even motels or hotels didn't want them here because they ran wild. Uh, very unusual childbearing policies. Uh, the mom also believed that it was good for kids to separate from them, and so she would leave without warning. You know, the babies and the toddlers and it was not good for them psychologically. They had no idea what was going on or when she was going to come back. But Dewey let her do it because it, it kind of helped her depression if she got out of there. Anyway, he became internationally renowned among scholars when he published a book on psychology, which was the first American book on psychology ever published. The ones they were using before that, they were all by German authors or European authors and such. Uh, his teaching career went from the University of Michigan to the University of Minnesota, back to Michigan, and again, and then finally in 1904, um, 1894 to 1904, um, he's at the University of Chicago, which was an interesting choice because um, at that time, the University of Chicago was a brand new school, it was Baptist, had Baptist principles, it was funded by Rockefeller money, and they were advertising themselves kind of as a Christian school. They were saying, you know, Harvard and Yale are gone. You know, they're gone to the church, but if you want your children to learn you know, Christian values, send them to the University of Chicago. Not that way anymore, is it? Anyway, so Dewey went there, and this is where he was extremely busy, extremely busy. He had many administrative duties. He uh, started the laboratory school there, which his wife later became principal of, and this is where he really got into his um, ideas of progressive education. He was very active in left-wing social causes in, in uh, Chicago, such as Jane Addams Whole House. She became one of his best friends. Labor union strikes, all these left-wing causes, he's active in them. Uh, in 1899, Dewey uh, aided the state of Hawaii in transforming their old-style classical education that was instituted by the Christian missionaries in the 1840s uh, to a progressive model that went over there and taught the teachers how to get rid of classical education and start progressive education. And that launched his international movement in uh, education. He went to many different countries and helped them establish progressive educational systems. Meanwhile, his growing anti-Christianity led him to total disillusionment with the University of Chicago. And he is quoted as saying that Chicago had offensive and blatant displays of piety. So he, he finally resigned. Um, he was in a controversy concerning his wife getting fired from the lab school. Just a whole interesting story on that. But here's a guy in his mid 40s. He's got five kids and he has no job. Okay, so what's he going to do? Well, his friends quickly came to the rescue and they arranged uh, funding from wealthy individuals to create a position for him at Columbia University in New York City. And that's where he went. And he loved it there because he had no more of these crushing administrative duties. He could just focus on his philosophy and do whatever he wanted, say whatever he wanted, nobody's going to bother him anymore. Um, while he was in, in, in New York, it's interesting, you sometimes wonder where he had time to teach because he's so involved in all these political movements in all these other countries. Um, he, he toured and advised China, Japan, Turkey, Mexico, the Soviet Union, that's an interesting one, isn't it? And South Africa helping them with their education department. In fact, the Soviets actually said that we thank you because you have helped us establish um, an educational system that will work with our politics. Um, during his New York years, he was also active in other radical groups, such as the First Humanist Society of New York, he was president of the American Psychological Association, American Federation of Teachers, um, he was a lifetime honorary president of the NEA, the NAACP, the ACLU, American Union Against Militarism, and signer, and some say partial author of the first Humanist Manifesto of 1933. He declined to run for governor of New York on the socialist ticket in 1930, um, 
but became active in socialist politics in the state of Wisconsin and was very influential in getting progressive politics in Wisconsin. He also chaired the Dewey, what was called the Dewey Commission on Trotsky. So he was involved in Soviet politics with you know this revolutionary struggle against Stalin and Trotsky, who was going to be the dictator, and he evidently supported the wrong guy, you know, and um, had this commission, you know, to exonerate Trotsky and so forth. And then the, from that point on, the Soviets, uh, you know, had no no room for him anymore, and uh, he went against violent communism. Dewey generally didn't get involved in uh, he didn't like controversy really. Um, but he did get involved in one controversy, and that was against the, the later president of the University of Chicago after he had left. That was Robert Hutchins, who was famous for the Great Books Movement, all, who also hired Mortimer Adler to be um, on staff there. And uh, they were tearing down what he was doing, what he had done when he, when, when he was there. And so the, there was this kind of war of words in the journals and the newspapers you know, against each other there. As an elderly man, he remarried and became very estranged from his children. The second wife got him written out, got the kids written out of the will, and separate, you know wouldn't let him see their dad and this kind of stuff. So it's, it's a very sad story in the end. Um, he was a prolific author, published over a thousand books, articles, and papers. And by his death, his reputation has been that of an international celebrity. When he was, um, he had big, massive birthday parties put on for him when he was 70, 80 and 90 years old. And some have said these are the biggest birthday parties ever put on for someone other than a president of the United States. Because he was just absolutely lionized in the United States until he died. But what happened um, during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s? What's going on? The Cold War, okay? So now it's no longer nice to talk about lionized John Dewey the socialist, you know. He's not popular. So what happened in our schools in our schools of education, they just they continued his policies, they continued his progressive ideas, but they just didn't tell you who they came from, because you know it's not politically correct anymore. Communism is out. So that is John Dewey. Um, if you, like I said, if you read Lutheran um, Education Journal, one of the, one of the articles I read just recently, this is from back in the 90s um, in the LA Journal talking about John Dewey. Poor John Dewey, he's just been misunderstood. And, you know, we just aren't able to understand his great intellect and it's been misinterpreted and blah, 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 blah. So, in one sense, he was misinterpreted because people have pegged on him the child-centered education. Dewey even said, I, I'm not in favor of child-centered education. The education I want is social-centered. I'm in for the collaborative, the collective, the socialist type education. So he was misinterpreted in that, but otherwise, I think we've been far too kind to him. Um, but I would say that he, he probably has affected Lutheran schools more than any of these, these guys. And so if you read this list of educational ideas advocated by Dewey, you'll see things that you see in Lutheran schools all the time. How much time is there left? Five minutes? Um, I'm going to stop here and we'll pick up on Bill Ayers tomorrow. Um, if you want to look over those... Uh, outlines any or any of the comments. If you may have a question on something that I did not cover very well, I'm just kind of reading this fast, so it's not been clear. Yes, Dr. Lee. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Prussian model that they brought over, the Prussian uh, system, dismantled class education in Germany. Well, we can realize those are the same Prussians that started the Prussian Union that when they combined all the churches, and that was what the founders of the Missouri Synod fled. And yet, so often they became open to the Russian, what they're doing in education. And it's just so, so ironic and such a, again, more evidence that classical education is the Lutheran uh, educational tradition. And so the, the Russians, though, uh, were where both of them started to get it off. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent point. Yeah, that our classical education is our legacy, and we we have abandoned it for heterodoxy, really. Yes. I wonder if uh, these guys all had a reform background. I wonder if the reform belief that Christ only died for the elect versus our belief that Christ died for all places in the, the role of I think 
I think it did for them in terms of rejecting Christianity, definitely, because they had legalistic um, pastors and, and they wondered if they were safe. And you know, the way they handled it was whatever, from Satan or self-delusion. Oh no, everyone's saved, you know, universal, no problem, don't worry. That's an excellent point, thank you for bringing that up. Anyone else? Yes, Dr. Calvert? Just uh, along the lines of what Dr. Beat said, uh, Prussian nationalism uh, very much influenced in places like Johns Hopkins and other universities. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was very much influenced by it, uh, as were other leaders, political leaders. Um, it also very much influenced the National Socialist Movement in Germany. And so, as far as this trajectory of progressivism, you know, this is very much connected to the uh, Prussian statism, the idea that the state knows best for the people. And this is something that politically, uh, Dewey was very much influenced very by. Very much, yeah. They're, well, they're all fellow travelers. Yeah. You can't really separate them. They're all buddies. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, Alicia? Yes. Um, when we go back to Rousseau and he was trying to get all the schools changed into this federal program. You mean Dewey or Rand, Howard Sand? Yeah. Um, was there a public outcry that the schools were doing horribly and then did those who elected in send their children to these types of schools versus this is what they were trying to do there? No, there, there wasn't um, an outcry that the schools weren't any good by the parents. Certainly not. But they were just excoriated publicly for, you know, you're, you're harming, it was like, like uh, Dr. Calvin mentioned, this, this patriotism from the Prussian nationalism. Man tried to kind of make it an American thing. You, you know, you're not patriotic if you don't support the state-run education system. He tied it to, you know, you're not, you're not American. So, so people were kind of browbeat in, in, into it, you know. Yes, Pastor. Um, back in Sheridan, we saw the DVD presentation of Waiting, uh, Waiting for Superman. Remember that? No. Uh, <laughs> well, it fits right in line with what uh, the contemporaries of that time of what you're saying. Uh, you have Hitler, Freud, Stalin, Tito, all these people. At the same time, you have Henry Ford and the big progressive uh, socialist. Uh, type of thing going on here. So you have a big man yeah. pushing something from the yeah. top down. They all, yeah. they all were in the same mindset. Yeah. And it's amazing that uh, uh, how we tend to forget that. Yeah. We don't realize how big an impact that was. Yes, thank you. Good point. Yes, so time out. Okay, one more question. Erica? Yeah, I, I just wanted to know how is it that the Lutheran Church and the Lutheran schools and even the university systems that we've had established got so duped by this? I think Dr. Steve Hines could answer that one better than anyone. Go ahead. We would make a great doctoral dissertation because I do not know the reason, but I do know on the basis of the studies that Korshak and others have done that when our Saxon forefathers came over here for educational reasons primarily. Those educational reasons were channeled almost 100% in the area of good Lutheran catechesis. In other words, when fully understanding Luther's blending of a classical liberal arts education with catechesis, that education, our founders thought, on American soil should be reserved only for those who were going to become pastors. So that in point of fact, the first implementation in American Lutheranism of, uh, of an intention, uh, universal use of a classical Lutheran education as Luther and Melanchthon conceived of it, was begun here just in the last few decades. Uh, why they made the decision that only pastors should have that classical education would be a great research project uh, because they certainly knew what that education was and they did implement it on all levels and did not be upwards for, for pastors. So it's a fascinating uh, reality. So we always hitched our wagon on American soil to simply what on American soil
soil uh, pedagogy for the masses was all about, and then we sought to put catechesis simply into the midst of it. Thank you. Thank you. Very well said. Hey, tomorrow we'll pick up on Bill Ayers and the methods of progressive education.